Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. From Latin America in the 80s to Southeast Asia in the 90s, the history of emerging market dust-ups is rich. And for Jay Pulaski, the co-founder and CIO of TPW Investment Management, these episodes of Instability provided critical early training on the never-say-never world of EM. On this episode of the Alpha Exchange, Jay recounts his days at Morgan Stanley, trained under Barton Biggs and responsible for allocating capital across asset classes and countries. We reminisce on the internet bubble that imploded as the century began and pivot to today's post-COVID market. Dominated by tech, propelled by low interest rates, and preoccupied by a certain event coming in November. Jay's framework views the world as tripolar, with the U.S., Asian, and European economies vying for global leadership and with a non-consensus view that Europe may finally turn a corner. We talk as well about the sudden stop of coronavirus and the unique way in which the asset price reaction was so immediate, leaving a backdrop of extremely low yields and a need to generate carry. As a result, in today's environment, Jay avoids government bonds but is overweight credit, and as the U.S. continues to fight COVID and ongoing dollar weakness results, sees a need to underweight U.S. equities in favor of unlikely regions like Europe. Lastly, in terms of potentially overlooked risks, Jay worries that a narrowing of the polls between Trump and Biden is something to watch for, as some controversial election outcome could derail market sentiment. Please enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Jay Pulaski. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Jay Pulaski. He is the co-founder and CIO of TPW Investment Management. Jay, thanks for joining me today. Pleasure to be here, Dean. It's great to reconnect and we'll have plenty to discuss in the world of global macro and the state of the economy and the history of global macro. I'd love to get started with your background a little bit, how you got into this industry. Talk to us about your early days in the world of financial markets. Happy to do that, Dean. We got to go way back to the 80s, though, <laughs> to do that. Came to New York in 83, having got a master's in international politics at the George Washington University, and was told I needed to get some finance on my resume. Was able to get into a bank training program at European American Bank, which was a consortium bank made up of a number of European banks in New York at the time, and went through the training program there. And after a year or so, realized that I didn't want to be a banker. And at the time, the emerging markets were just kind of starting to percolate. And the ability to kind of think internationally and have a framework to compare international markets and countries was starting to become of interest to people. And so I was able to pivot and got a job with a small Wall Street firm, Carl Marx and Company, Carl with a C and Marx with a K. And I did non-Japan Asia research. And this was in 1986, 87. So I was there the day, the Black Monday, infamous Black Monday in October of 87. And I remember it because it just, it was staggering to kind of watch the tape at that time almost go by with just the incredible decline. And it had personal ramifications. I was supposed to go to Asia on my first trip the next week in late October, and that was canceled. And then two or three months later, I came back from vacation, called into the boss's office on a Monday morning and told I was fired, that the family, which was behind the trading desk and capital for the desk, decided they didn't want to do that anymore. And so the vagaries of Wall Street were made known to me very quickly and out on my ear with no severance or nothing in early 1988. And so a couple of the guys and I started an independent research company that failed. And so 1989, 1990, I find myself unemployed and I'm working as a waiter at the Forest Hills Tennis Club. I had never been a waiter. And I said, I was living in Queens at the time. And I said, let me do something which I haven't done before, which was wait tables. And I did that. And then I also went back to an old standby for a football player like myself, former football player. I served as security at the door, or as they say, a bouncer at a club in Queens, in Astoria, Queens, which was connected to the, let's say, the underworld at the time. 
those were the jobs I had when in June of 1990, I was hired by Morgan Stanley. So I went from being a bouncer and a waiter to working at Morgan Stanley Asset Management. And I was hired by Barton Biggs, who's a well-known name in finance. And Barton, and this is typical Barton and kind of typical of the investment banks at the time, Barton said to me, hey, we need you to go down and start a Brazil fund. Now, I am a non-Japan Asian expert, so to speak. Spoke no Spanish, no Portuguese, never been to Latin America. But I presented myself, I was 30 years old roughly at the time, as a guy who can get things done. And they said, okay, go do it. We want to start this Brazil fund. And that taught me a great lesson because this is 1990. And if you go back, Dean, and look on a dollar-based chart of the Vovespa, the Brazilian stock market, you'll see that 1990 was literally the low. And yet we could not, Morgan Stanley and the IFC, which is an arm of the World Bank that was active at the time helping to seed these emerging market country funds, we could not raise any money. And so it was a great lesson on the difference between the time to market and the time to invest. It was absolutely the time to invest, but could not raise any money. We ultimately did raise money mostly from Tiger Management, Julian Robertson, who was a good friend of Barton's, put up the money. And off we went. A year later, we launched a regional fund on the New York Stock Exchange. And so for several years, I was all through Latin America, Colombia, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, all the countries and had a wonderful time. And then was asked to move to the buy side as markets evolve and form Morgan Stanley's Latin American equity research effort and service strategist. And IPO business was happening. We needed research. And so I formed the team, served as strategist, and got another good lesson at that time. 1994 came along in the Mexican peso crisis, and I was the Latin American strategist. I was number one in II, top-ranked strategist, and I was out in California hiking in the Redwoods and came back and wrote a story titled Bears in the Woods, which you're out camping, you hear that rustling in in the underbrush, and you think, a bear is going to come and maul you or whatever. And of course, it's nothing. And I made the analogy that that's the same thing in terms of these fears about the Mexican peso being devalued. It's just noise. It's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. And of course, a week or two later, I got a call in the middle of the night or something like that and was told that the government had devalued the peso. And so I was a poster child for how Wall Street got Mexico wrong. And if you remember in those days, that was the first time that a lot of non-EM investors were in Mexico. A lot of S&P managers were cheating a little bit on their benchmark because at the time, those markets were really flying. So Wall Street Journal, C1 front page, how Wall Street got it wrong. Jay Pulaski is exhibit number one. And Byron Wien, another Morgan Stanley strategist, now vice chairman at Blackstone, we had a great macro team back then, Morgan Stanley as an aside, Barton Biggs, Byron Wing, Steve Roach, Stephen Jen, Richard Davidson. We had just a fantastic group. So Byron pulls me aside after I had to get up in that Monday morning meeting, explain how I had gotten it completely wrong. And he said to me, he pulled me aside, he said, Jay, you can be wrong at the top and you can be wrong at the bottom, but you cannot be wrong at both the top and the bottom. So in other words, I had to figure out that bottom and make sure I got it. I survived that, was asked to then move and create the firm's first multi-asset, multi-regional product, the global emerging market strategy product. So that brought me front and center for the Asian financial crisis in 1998, for Russia's two nuclear to fail. You may remember all those stories and those headlines. I was front and center for that. And then moved from there to launch a global equity strategy product with Barton. Barton was our global strategist, but it was just Barton. There was no product. There was no structure. So we shored that and worked with Barton on that. And then the last thing I did at Morgan Stanley was develop a global asset allocation strategy product. Let's go back to your days in the 90s. It'll be valuable to get some of your perspective and take on the multitude of risk events that seem to emanate from EM. These regions, I think, sometimes invite capital, and then very quickly that capital flees, and then you get these events of instability, and then you've got sometimes political systems that are 
fragile as well. So I'd love to just, as you think about, let's say, the 90s, because as you described, there were a number of these events in the 90s, some of which are economics at their core. Sometimes they're political decisions that are made. What are, if you want to kind of be specific about one or two of those events, maybe some of the takeaways around maybe misreading intentions of governments or maybe misunderstanding a situation as less fragile than it actually is? What are some of the big picture takeaways from managing capital through those times? A lot of it has to do with the policies around currency. If you think about it, these were small markets, small capital markets, relatively undeveloped capital markets. I, mean, I remember when I was sitting in the Sao Paulo in 1990, we raised like 20 million bucks and we were trying to invest it. And we were doing it with BNDS, which is the National Development Bank of Brazil. We were basically taking slices of their portfolio and kind of providing liquidity into the market because they were virtually very thinly traded. So 20 million bucks was a lot of money in 1990 in Brazil, hard as that is to believe. And so part of it is the undeveloped nature of the markets at the time. Part of it was the lack of experience of policymakers in the countries for dealing with capital flows from abroad because they hadn't really had any. This was new. And so part of it was you had money come in and currencies tended to appreciate. People borrowed in that foreign currency, namely in dollars, the governments did, and corporates, but primarily governments. And then when something went wrong, right, a bad policy or commodity shift or whatever the case may be, depending on whether it was Mexico in the 90s or Asia in the late 90s, basically a lot of it had to do with the fact that money, as you put it, money came in, currencies and stocks and value of financial assets goes up. Then when money goes out, they're left high and dry and the currency rate couldn't hold. And so you had these currencies break. Like I said, in the middle of the night, Mexico devalued the currency. It was fixed. It wasn't floating. So one of the th reasons why we're talking about this in the 90s, as opposed to talking about this in the 2000s, is because after 98, the most emerging countries, and we've seen it play out in real time in the last six months, they have floating currencies. They no longer are fixed. And so you don't have the breakage that you had at that time. And so now what you've seen is we've pivoted from EM being the source and the epicenter of crisis, financial crisis, to DM, and primarily the United States being the epicenter of financial crisis, whether it was 2000 in the tech bubble or 2008 with the great financial crisis. The last two major, not including COVID, because that's a different animal, I think. But the last two crises that really were global and had real ramifications were centered here in the United States. And so what's interesting, and even I was just thinking about this over the last day or two in preparation for our discussion, it's amazing to me that in this environment, the U.S. still, even after 08, 09, where the U.S. was the clear epicenter of the crisis, and yet what was the best performing asset in the years 2010 to 2020, it was US equities. And so it's kind of amazing that the epicenter of the last two crises still has been the place to be. And I think one of the great questions for investors thinking forward the next couple of years, is that going to be sustained? I think that's one of the great questions out there. You mentioned the tech bubble, and I know that Barton Biggs, one of his many contributions to the investment industry was a real sober analysis of what was happening. And if we can rewind 20 years, I like to say it's very difficult even now to compare what's happening in tech to then, only because the then was just so extraordinary in terms of the valuation bubble. But I'm curious if you can give us some perspective on that period of managing capital through the tech bubble, the observations that your team had during that period. What are some of the big takeaways from that time? <laughs> in the one sense, they're great questions. In the other sense, you're really testing the old memory bank, my friend. <laughs> but we can do it for sure, because those are some pretty vivid memories. I remember, obviously, plenty of the things about Barton's point of view in that time and our whole strategy point of view. As I said, I think we had the best macro team on Wall Street during those years, without a doubt. But I remember the thing that sticks in my mind is Julian Robertson, 
enjoy and just fighting, fighting, fighting that tech bubble and basically giving up just when he probably shouldn't have, if I recall correctly. And I see that when Barton was very skeptical as well. I think a lot of people were very skeptical because the history of segments of the market, the Nifty 50 or the tech bubble or today's tech sector, the fangs, it's always the same thing. I mean, things get bid up to levels that are unsustainable and you can never tell what is going to be the thing that pricks the bubble. And I personally don't think we're in a tech bubble at the moment, but we were in one at that time because as you say, it was so new. And one of the things, obviously, it's kind of like crypto or Tesla now, because the thing that allows the bubble is the newness and the ability to put any kind of story to the new. You can create any number of potential things happening because it's new and it's open-ended. And when you have an open-ended thesis, you can ascribe any value you want to it. Pets.com or whatever you want to say. The difference, of course, is that today's technology, these are huge money-making machines that are printing money virtually. And they're not virtually in the sense of like almost, you know, effectively almost like printing machines. People talk about the brrrr of the Fed printing money. There's the brrrr of Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook and Google printing money. And the other thing that's very different, obviously, is that today you have zero interest rates. And so the valuation of those cash flows is just much, much higher. And so I think there's no doubt in my mind that we're extended, but I also don't think it's anywhere near what it was then, in large part because it's no longer new. And that's why I say crypto is kind of interesting. And I'm no expert by any stretch, but it's, again, the new thing that you can attach any kind of story you want to, and it's hard to disprove. And so you have that belief system, which supports itself by going higher, which brings in more buyers. And then, as I said, you can't really tell what's going to prick the bubble. To me, it's a lot about the new allows an open-ended framework, which allows people to put any hope or dream or valuation on something, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy until it doesn't. I mean, you've got a, a number of things there that I really believe tie in nicely. I mean, the first I'm thinking is, as you mentioned, trying to raise that Brazil fund in 1990, and the valuation was there. It just, you couldn't get the interest. And it's almost the opposite of pushing back against the tech bubble in 2000. The short story is there, but you could lose your shirt or your career in a matter Absolutely. of a day if you pick the wrong day <laughs> to get short. Exactly. And I also I was just going to say that you mentioned crypto, you mentioned gold. And because these items don't really have a valuation framework, as you suggest, it becomes alluring and you could ascribe any multiple you want to it. And that's where I wanted to go, which is we're in this time where things have changed so suddenly. We have an economy that's adjusting very quickly in the sense of there are new technologies that are being used, but the fallout from COVID is unmistakably challenging for the traditional businesses. And you have so much intervention necessarily from the Fed, from the government, that has certainly been important for keeping the labor market intact in some ways or providing income support to people that have lost their jobs. But we're in this period of what could be remarkable change. I just think about crypto as this sort of right tail asset that, again, I have no idea what it's worth either. I think that's kind of part of the allure of it. When you were mentioning the framework for TPW and just how you think about utilizing ETFs in a global macro construct, and it's a long product. What's on your mind these days? Just kind of take us through 2020 from TPW's standpoint, an asset price shock, and then just lots of adjustment in the last couple of months. What is most top of mind for you right now? No, that's great, Dean. And I think that's a great lead in for me. So I'm going to take a step back and describe the formation of TPW, then come into your question. So TPW stands for the tripolar world. The tripolar world basically means a thesis that I developed post 0809. If you think about the response to the great financial crisis, it was purely monetary. The elected officials 
the folks who control the fiscal levers really did nothing in any country. It was all the unelected central bank officials who flooded the system with cash and liquidity to get us out of that. And to me, there were two things about the GFC. One, it broke globalization. Because as I thought about it, finance, as we talked about with the EM in the 90s, was the tip of the globalization spear. All this capital flowing all around the world. You had the Washington consensus of opening up economies, providing opportunities for growth, able to sell to all these different countries, able to produce in these different countries. All that effectively was halted with the great financial crisis, because certainly the banks and the finance rolled back up upon itself. You had the fallout politically, which took a while, but manifested with Brexit and the election of President Trump. And now we've seen it, of course, accelerate even further with the fight and the development, I think, of a strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China. So TPW, the tripolar world, was my argument that basically we're moving from full-throated globalization to regionalization, regional integration in the three main poles of Asia, Europe, and the Americas, thus the tripolar world. And there were three drivers to this regional integration. Each region's growing ability to self-finance. We talked about EM back in the early 90s, but today you have China, one of the second or third biggest equity and bond markets in the world. You have Latin America with the development of the pension funds. So each region, Europe, of course, developing its financial markets, particularly on the corporate bond side. So you have each region's growing ability to self-finance. Each region's growing ability to self-produce, you think of advanced manufacturing, robotics, 3D printing, the ability to bring production, not jobs, production back on shore. And then third, each region's growing ability to self-consume. You think about urbanization, rise of the service sector, and of course, e-commerce. So all that is driving forward, and I think now accelerating in the age of COVID. So in January, in December, we wrote our 2020 outlook, and the title was The Great Rotation. So we were arguing that we were about to have a recovery in the manufacturing side of the global economy and a rotation in kind of the various segments of the stock market and various markets around the world, which would lead the markets going forward, namely the shift from growth to value and from the U.S. to the non-U.S., because those non-U.S. markets particularly developed, represent more of a value and cyclical tilt. They don't have as much technology as the United States does. So then in January, we published a piece, TPW 3.0, which argues that tech and climate were two new additions to the three that I mentioned before. Tech were big believers and have been writing about it since January. Now it's front page news almost daily, but we were talking about it back in January about Splinternet the splintering of the internet between the U.S. and China, with Europe serving as the regulator. Europe doesn't necessarily have a dog in the fight, but Europe does have 600 million eyeballs and a regulatory framework that folks are going to have to live up to if they want to access those eyeballs. So we're seeing that play out with Huawei, et cetera. And then in climate, the same type of thing, not being dealt with globally, Paris Accord dead, can't do it individually. You think about New Zealand suffering from the bush fire smoke coming from Australia, but regionally you can attack it. And so that's kind of the mindset as we approached COVID in March. So we were long, we were positive, we were long equities, we were long cyclicals, we were long value, and we were doing pretty well. The last part of 2019 and the first couple of months of 2020 were pretty good. And then of course we had COVID. And we got smacked pretty good because we were pretty fully invested. And to me, the things that are important about COVID are a couple. First of all, and people really struggled with this, everything was front-loaded. The bad news was front-loaded. It was a sudden stop, as opposed to the mentality of most folks in thinking about recession, is that it builds on itself over time. Here, the bad news was right up front. As we saw with jobless claims, and as we've seen basically since March and April, the news gets better. And that 
combined with the second thing, which I think is people have really struggled to deal with, is the speed. And the speed of the spread, the speed of the governmental response was much faster than in even 09. It was much more broad. It was not just the monetary, it was monetary and fiscal. So that's very different. People struggle to make sense of that. The speed of the market reaction, one of these days, today, tomorrow, next week, we're going to have a new all-time high in the S&P, unprecedented speed of market reaction, both in terms of the decline and the recovery, which has freaked people out. And now, as we touched on, the speed of the scientific response. So the way I've been approaching it, I've got two thoughts. One we touched on, which the old adage in the market is you don't want to fight the Fed. So now if you're negative, you're fighting the Fed. You're fighting the fiscal policy makers, and not just in one country, but globally. And you're fighting the entire global scientific community. I don't think that's a winning fight. I don't want to fight that fight. So that's one. Two, over the last couple of months, we've developed what we call the COVID formula for investing. And it goes as follows. First, you have to control the virus. You control the virus that allows you to reopen your economy. You reopen your economy, you're able to stimulate domestic demand, which is key because global trade has collapsed down 20% year over year in Q2. So domestic demand is key. You stimulate that domestic demand, you open it up again, and that allows your stock market to broaden out to get into that rotation trade. That rotation trade allows you to move higher. Now, the contrast to that is the failure to control the virus, which sadly, as we talked about a little bit before we started, the U.S. is alone virtually among the developed economies in failing to control the virus. Therefore, you can't reopen fully. Therefore, your domestic demand is constrained. Therefore, your need for stimulus is greater. Therefore, you have higher political risk. And we're seeing this play out right now, real time in the United States. Over the last couple of weeks, we need more stimulus, clearly, because we haven't been able to reopen as fast as we thought we could or as fully as we thought we could. That leads us to the political risk that we're seeing here. I mean, it's amazing to me. I don't really get the strategy of the administration in not making a deal here, because clearly, to me anyway, I think the, the rational thought of a political incumbent with three months from an election is to provide what people need. So they'll vote for them. So I don't really get that. Maybe we can talk about it later. But you have higher political risk, and that leads to a weaker currency. And we're seeing that in the dollar. The dollar's had its worst run in a decade. And so it's interesting that the view of market participants, as I see it, is not really being expressed necessarily in equities, because the U.S. is doing pretty well. It's not outperforming the rest of the world. The, The leaders are And again, we've talked about this, the first in, first out. So first in COVID, first out, and that's Asia and China. And if you look year to date, you see that, in fact, China is far outperforming the United States in dollar terms. Asia is far outperforming the United States more broadly. And increasingly, you have the opportunity, as I see it, to, in the second half of the year, now thinking going kind of forward, we're of the view that this distinction, I did a piece a couple of weeks ago called sharpening the lines of distinction. This distinction between the U.S. ability to deal with COVID and that of the other developed economies is going to sharpen over these next couple of months because these other economies are going to have a better economic outcome because they're more able to be open and thus sustain their domestic demand, as we talked about very important part of the COVID investing formula, and the U.S. is not. And so as I see it now, if you look, technology stocks are doing great. But tech, even with five stocks being 20% or whatever the numbers are of the S&P, it's not enough to take the market significantly higher. We need the rotation trade to manifest itself. Namely, we need economic recovery, higher interest rates at the long end, better performance out of the financials, the industrials, energy, et cetera, to drive the market to significant new highs. We have been of the view and wrote about it in May that we expected new all-time highs. 
And we are now, as, we, as I just said, we're a day or two away from it. So we're going to get that. The question is, what happens next? Because again, the thing that's so interesting about COVID age is the speed. You have to think forward. If you're thinking backwards or thinking even in real time, you're going to miss it. And I think that, as I said, is one of the things that people have really struggled with. They've struggled with the front-loaded nature. So markets just care about direction. Markets want to know where we're going. And so the market read it right in market in kind of quotations. Market got it right and immediately started moving up because the bad news was front loaded. And going forward, now we're in a little bit more of a tricky time, particularly for the U.S. If we don't get the stimulus, the data flow from the U.S. is going to be less compelling, particularly versus other parts of the world, namely Europe and Asia. And I believe that the big question is, is the dollar signaling what's going to happen in equities. So far, equities in the U.S. have been able to sustain relative performance while the dollar has fallen sharply. Is the dollar a leading indicator of where equities are going is question one. The other question is how do equities handle rising rates at the long end? We know the Fed is not going to raise rates for years. We know the front end is fixed. The back end, long duration stuff, just had its fifth biggest move or third biggest move in five days in like 30 or 40 years last week. And so I'm a believer that we're going to see higher rates at the long end. That's going to stimulate the rotation trade. That's where you want to be invested, cyclicals, value, et cetera. You mentioned a couple things there on both fighting the Fed and then fighting the Congress. And different sides can argue the way in which the Congress came together to provide income support. I'm wondering just with regard to the outlook going forward, let's say for risk assets for equities, how much of it is contingent on Congress coming together and continuing to provide pretty extraordinary levels of income support and then being willing to run deficits that are much more substantial than anything we've dealt with before? Is that a big part of what's necessary to be excited about being long? If you look in that first in, first out category, China has actually done a pretty remarkable job of keeping its economy afloat without resorting to the drastic stimulus that the rest of Europe and the United States have had to do. That's kind of interesting right there. China then shifts its focus to what's the new strategy called dual circulation where it's focused on generating domestic demand. As we talked about before, that's part of the COVID. One of the things that helped me kind of conjure up the COVID investing formula is that idea that you have to stimulate domestic demand at a time when global trade is running 15 to 20% below year ago levels. If you can't stimulate your own demand, then you're stuck. And so as we talked about, control of the virus, reopen, domestic demand, rotation, higher stock prices. That formula is, I believe, going to and is playing out in Asia and in Europe. And so we're significantly overweight non-U.S. equities versus the U.S. versus benchmark. The U.S. in the point is you weighed out exactly. The U.S. is in a different story where we have not controlled the virus. Thus, we cannot reopen fully. Thus, we cannot generate our own domestic demand. Thus, we need more stimulus. And we have the political risk of a election period where it behooves the Democrats to probably, I think the Democrats have the upper hand and they're exercising it. I think the Republicans, as I said, I don't really understand the unwillingness to come to a deal, even if it's whatever, it's one size is three trillion, one size is one. Let's meet in the middle of two. That seems pretty straightforward. I'm amazed it hasn't happened yet because clearly we're going to feel the effects of that in a very short order. When people who spend money, and that's usually the folks who are less wealthy, and they spend what they have, are cut back significantly, they will spend less. And that's what we're basically, we're going to go through that experiment. So to me, I think the U.S. is in that sad and unfortunate situation of having failed to control the virus and everything else flows from that. And so my whole thesis is the countries that do control it have a better chance at stimulating their domestic demand. And I want to be in those countries because that's the driver in a world where COVID-19 and the U.S.-China rivalry 
are both accelerants to the tripolar world. They're accelerating the focus on regional integration. We're breaking up technology-wise, we're breaking up trade-wise, and now we're breaking up arguably COVID-wise into regional blocks. And as a global multi-asset investor, I want to be in the blocks that have demonstrated the capacity to deal with the issue. Now, once we get a vaccine, what happens then? That's another interesting story. And we're already seeing the politicalization of the vaccine distribution start to manifest itself, with China saying that it's going to provide vaccines to all the key countries around the world. And the U.S., again, not saying anything about helping anybody. In my view, we are, I mean, that's a whole nother uh, discussion, the, the rivalry between China and the U.S. I think we're losing that rivalry badly, misplaying the process considerably. And I think it's manifesting itself every day in virtually every way. The dollar is weak. The renminbi is strong. The China stock market is outperforming. We are forcing China. And here, this is why the tripolar world allows us to have a point of view, because we've been thinking deeply about this stuff for a decade. We are forcing China to become a stronger competitor. Why we want to do that, I don't really know, but that's what we're doing. And again, as an investor, we're underweight U.S. tech. We're overweight emerging market tech. There are some great vehicles where you can get exposure to all the major e-commerce and internet companies throughout the entire emerging markets in one ETF. It's one of the real virtues of the ETF construct. And that is one of our biggest positions. And it's been a total rock star. And it will continue to be because COVID is accelerating the internet and e-commerce process, which, as I said, when we talked about TPW, that's one of the three drivers. Each region's growing ability to self-consume. That is happening. And then the, the other thing, I want to make sure we don't forget to mention it, Dean, is we're very bullish on Europe. And we're making the case that the decade of the 2020s could be the decade of Europe. And when we look at the ability of Europe to come together, 27 countries, and organize a joint recovery fund, when we contrast that with the U.S. inability to come to a deal on this way to stimulus package, when we look at Europe's embracing of its Green Deal, and we contrast that with the complete and total panning of the U.S. approach to a Green New Deal, those things, technology, ability to govern, ability to deal with climate change. Those are the things that are driving Europe and Europe's integration. So Europe, with the Joint Recovery Fund, which for the first time allows joint issuance of debt, and with the Green Deal, which talks about a carbon tax and the potential, the need, once you have joint debt issuance, to have joint taxation, you're seeing the outlines of a tech and climate carbon kind of construct where Europe will become bigger and better and more tightly integrated. And you see nothing of that in the Americas. When I think of the world, I think of Asia and by China, I think of Europe integrating rapidly. And I think of the Americas completely kind of dead in the water. And it looks like the dollar may be starting to express that. And as I said before, the dollar lead Equities, I think, is one of the key questions if you're considering the equity market space. I wanted to step back and think about the asset classes. And as you mentioned, the Fed has got the short end or even the medium end pretty anchored towards zero. And as you talk about a European recovery fund, all of these things regarding debt, I think, are pretty important to think about, especially in light of how much debt's being issued and then at what price. The world is being forced to essentially underwrite debt at levels that, at least on paper, aren't really appetizing. If you look at nominal yields, even versus low inflation rates, you've got negative real rates for all of the developed world and even negative nominal rates in Europe. What do you think about just the next five or 10 years in terms of the risk-free asset class? How should investors think about the role of the defensive properties of bonds in their portfolio in light of the skinny yields (laughs) that they're providing? How does a pension fund make it in such a circumstance? That's absolutely the right question. And ending on the pension funds is absolutely the right spot, Dean, because they're in big trouble. 
and thus we're all kind of in big trouble. Because as you've seen with all the flap about CalPERS, they have a 7% return target. And how you get a 7% return in a diversified global portfolio when your fixed income component yields virtually nothing, as opposed to five years ago, it yielded 5%, that's completely dissipated. These pension funds, by the way, have already made the move into the private side. So they're already 25 or 30% private. And private credit and all this stuff has already been pretty fully expressed and invested in. So I think you're absolutely right. I think there are a couple of things I would say. First, you use the term forced to enforce to invest in these skinny yields. I don't see it that way. I mean, to me, it's like people are desperate <laughs> to invest in these things. And you've seen that with tremendously long dated issuance out of European countries. You've seen Italy be able to issue tremendous amounts of debt. The European periphery has been one of the best places to be in the fixed income markets this year. Emerging market, dollar denominated debt, also been a very strong asset because basically there's a search for yield. And that search for yield is going to continue because as we've already discussed, the Fed has made it clear they're not going to raise rates for a period of probably a year or two. Now, if there's a vaccine and everybody's fine and we fast forward nine months and in June of 2021, things are pretty much back and probably rip roaring if that happens, then the Fed's probably going to recalibrate and we may have a different discussion on our hands. But to me, the long end of the sovereign bond market in the developed economies is very unappealing, very unappealing. I think it's rolling over. I expect higher rates. I expect the 10-year bond to get closer to zero. I expect the 10-year treasury to be over one in the next three to six months. Now, but that's not that big a deal. I mean, people talk about the Fed yield curve control and capping the long end, and it's probably not going to go to three, but is it going to go to zero or one? I think we're going to one, one and a quarter, maybe one and a half, which again, will stimulate that rotation trade we talked about. The other thing, obviously, that negative real yields does is it's wonderful for gold, wonderful for silver, for precious metals, great for crypto. Anything that competes with that yield product is when there's no yield, that becomes, by definition, much more appealing. It's great, as we talked about, for technology. One of the reasons why I think tech it can't take the U.S. equity market materially higher is because I do expect higher interest rates, and I think that will be negative for tech stocks and tech valuations. Also, there's a huge IPO calendar for tech, which is going to suck away some of the demand, I believe. So what does this environment mean? It means the search for yield continues. How do we play that? We're massively underweight government debt. We're massively overweight credit. We like emerging market dollar debt, not really local currency. Even with a weak dollar, I think EM has a lot of problems as an asset class, which I'll be happy to talk about. We like things like preferreds. We love preferreds. We have a very big position there. We like tips. They have a very sizable position in tips. And so I think, because I do expect there to be some inflation over the next six to 12 months, the Fed is going to let it run. Therefore, the opportunity set, that's one of the reasons why I think gold does pretty well, regardless of the environment here, and silver as well. So to me, I think the folks, the 60-40, the risk parity, that's really a tough nut to crack because obviously the fixed income piece is not going to be able to provide the ballast that it has in the past. And so I do think some of those strategies, which again, makes sense. We know that we've been in the markets a long time. I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is the need to be flexible and not rigid in my thinking. And certain strategies work for certain periods of time in certain markets. And then when the market outlook changes, market structure changes, the strategies that work change. And if you're going to be a long-term investor or someone who's going to stay in the business for a long period of time, you have to be able to adapt. And so one of the things that I've always kind of prided myself on is the ability to synthesize, the ability to construct almost stories or narratives, and the ability to kind of let the market tell me rather than me tell the market. And so We named our company TPW. I always like the term chameleon in terms of thinking about market. You've got to be able to blend and work in different scenarios and different environments. And clearly, where we are today 
we have a different environment. Fixed income investors need to think differently. Multi-asset, 60-40 risk parity people need to think differently. And hey, by the way, I do think that we've crossed the Rubicon and we are in a world where fiscal stimulus is going to continue to play an important role. I expect that to be true should there be a change in administrations in the United States. It's clearly true in Europe, which is why the euro has responded. The Joint Recovery Fund is a three to five to seven year program. The European budget is a seven year budget. That's set up for the next seven years. That's why the euro has responded more favorably than European equities. I believe European equities will follow, again, kind of like the dollar. Dollar weakness signify US equity weakness on a relative basis. Euro strength signify European equity strength on a relative basis going forward. I do think investors are going to need to become more comfortable with much bigger deficits. And to me, that's fine. I mean, the issue is not the size of the debt, in my opinion, not the size of the debt, it's the carrying costs. And the carrying cost is extremely low. So when we have high unemployment, low global trade, need to stimulate domestic demand, money for free, we should take the free money, improve our infrastructure. There's so many things we can do with it. It's clear. There's a ton of things to do. The Europeans, I think, are going to start to show the way with the juxtaposition of the recovery fund and the Green Deal. There's no shortage of things to put people to work doing to stimulate your own domestic demand. The countries, as I said, in my view, the countries that can stimulate their own domestic demand, go back to that COVID investing formula. Those are the ones who are going to be successful, control their own destiny, regionally integrate. And as a global investor, I've written, I think, people, you can't travel now, particularly if you're an American. Sadly, we're not <laughs> invited to a lot of countries. But if you're a global investor, you need to dust off the old atlas and start really thinking about other parts of the world. Because I do believe that we're at the end of the decade-long run of U.S. financial asset outperformance. One of the things we have to force ourselves to do is just try to think about the types of risks that just might be overlooked in the market. It's very easy in hindsight to see how the market got something wrong, but it's very difficult in the moment to capitalize on it. Sometimes, as we were talking about with the tech bubble, the force of asset prices is so strong that even though you might have spotted something that's unstable, you can't get in front of it. And right now, we have the force of governments and the Fed and other central banks pushing asset prices higher. What are the things that you think are chief areas of worry for you and your team that the market may not fully appreciate? What are those types of things that are the derailers of what's been a pretty good run here in asset prices? You're absolutely right. It's all about the timing. So often people hold out, hold out, hold out. We talked about Julian Robertson and the tech bubble in 2000 and then cave at the very wrong moment. I'm certainly, <laughs> it's happened to me a few times over the years, without a doubt. I'm sure probably same to you as well. I mean, the only guy who's never struck out is the guy who doesn't swing the bat. So if you're in the markets, you're going to miss time stuff down the road. So let me give you two risks that are kind of evident. And then I'll give you one that I don't think is very evident. And then one that I think is overstated. So the two that are kind of well known are the lack of a stimulus package. It is impressive to me that the U.S. equity market has been able to move forward even with the intrinsics in Washington. That's a bit of a surprise to me. I think it's offset by the sense that uh, vaccine is coming closer. And so a big risk is if there is no vaccine or if it fails. And these testing advances turn out to be unworkable for whatever reason. And so let's say three months from now, we're in the same place as we are today in terms of vaccine and testing, we're going to be lower in equity prices, in my view. One risk that I think is overstated is the risk of the U.S.-China rivalry. Obviously, it gets a huge amount of headlines, but I think it is absent a either a financial war where we kind of kick them out of the SWIFT clearing system, or a shooting war where we actually have a accidental downing of a plane or a blowing up of a ship. I don't think the U.S.-China rivalry will impede either 
asset market, China or the U.S. And one of the reasons is because, as you and I know, Dean, markets hate uncertainty. And what is certain is that there will continue to be this bashing of U.S. and China back and forth. That's a given. That is a key plank of President Trump's reelection campaign, and we are going to continue to see it now through November. But we have been dealing with this as investors for years now. And I go back and reference again the performance of the China equity market and currency market as a suggestion that the investors don't really care. Yeah, it can afford, it can hit individual companies like Huawei. Yeah, maybe even kind of Alibaba and the China tech companies a little bit. But broadly speaking, I think it's overstated. And then the risk that I think is underappreciated is the political risk in the United States. And basically, my concern is not that the polls continue to show a likely Biden victory or even a sweep by the Democrats. My concern is that we have a tightening of the polls in the next couple of months that leads to people really being concerned that we have a contested election an election where there's maybe no apparent winner or a election where the president does not accept the outcome. These are the kinds of things the U.S., in my view, relative to the rest of the world, is increasingly dysfunctional. And the political impasse like that would, I think, have significant negative effects on U.S. financial asset prices. And I think it's most market participants, I think, look at it as a tightening of polls would be bullish. I think it would be very negative. And you already kind of see it playing out a little bit in the options market. Options for October, November, the VIX is, I think, significantly higher than the current day, which, by the way, is under 20 as of yesterday. So to me, that's an underappreciated risk. I think you make a great point there. And the pricing of uncertainty in and around that election is already pretty, the market's expressing itself about that uncertainty. And I like the nuance there that one of the things we learned about the Hillary Clinton run in 2016 was that there is a hidden bid for Trump, that folks were more supportive of him than they were willing to admit maybe with the polls. And I think you could argue easily that it's only that notion is probably more significant these days because the polls are so Biden centric right now, people are not as worried. So you make a good point about the tightening of polls. That's really interesting. I just wanted to finish with the Fed and and some of the commentary in the marketplace around modern monetary theory. Everyone has a different view on what this is, but you certainly, as you were describing the world as it is and it is likely to remain, it's one in which deficits are significant. They're higher than we thought they ever should be or could be. Remember back in the early days of the Clinton administration, there were the deficit hawks, the bond vigilantes. These folks are nowhere in sight. What should we think about over the kind of coming years in terms of monetary policy, its interaction with fiscal policy? How does that fit into how you think about the world of markets? I think the one point that really jumps out is you want to be invested in markets and economies that have flexibility to use both monetary and fiscal policy. I mean, there's a lot of concern in the markets about misuse of those levers, and MMT is a major issue. But to me, I'd much rather have it than not. And I draw the distinction between the developed economies and the emerging economies. And outside of China, which granted is almost half of the EEM at this point, outside of China, no emerging country has the capacity that the developed advanced economies have in terms of the ability to borrow in their own currency, in terms of the ability to therefore run big deficits, and in terms of the ability to stimulate their economy in that fashion. And so to me, structurally and strategically, EM is at a significant disadvantage than DM. When we talk about being overweight the non-US, we are overweight non-US developed markets, not EM. So that's point one. And I'd extend that to, we want to be, again, to me, 
we have to accept where we are. And where we are is in a different place than where we have been. And we, as I mentioned to me, regional integration, not globalization, domestic demand creation, not global trade, assume we get past the virus, capacity, therefore, to stimulate your domestic demand will be key. That requires fiscal policy. Monetary policy is exhausted. Okay, I'm not a big believer in negative rates stimulating economic activity. Therefore, fiscal policy is what's left. And to use fiscal policy when the cost of doing so is virtually free, i.e. rates extremely low, one should do that. Particularly if you can argue that what you do with that money has a return that's higher than the cost of capital. You go back to the very basics of things and you think about it from a governmental sense as opposed to a corporate sense. Now, yes, plenty of people feel very strongly that government can't do anything and it's a waste of money and et cetera, et cetera. I don't fully share that. I mean, obviously it's a concern and there are plenty of examples of waste and fraud and et cetera, but there's also plenty of examples of things being done pretty well by governments around the world. And so again, to me, it takes me back to this idea of Europe, the decade of the 2020s being the decade for Europe. Europe has the most upside to integrating itself around that tech regulatory climate thrust, integrating those things, joint debt issuance. That's the direction they're going, which is just unlocks tremendous opportunity. So if you think about right now, the treasury market is the risk-free asset there is no European bond market. What about over the next three to five years, we develop a European bond market? And it is, there's a risk-free rate, and it's not going to be the blend. It'll be a blend, so it'll probably it'll be above zero. You can see Austria and others issuing 100-year bonds as an example. So to me, that's the kind of thing that's really, really interesting. Where's the flexibility? Where's the upside? And the upside to having a new risk-free asset that is a European representation, then you have something similar in China. China is developing a tremendous bond market. It has yields 250 basis points above the United States. It's got a stronger currency. It's being incorporated into the indices. In three to five years, I think you will see something like a European <laughs> bond market, thus allowing European-wide fiscal stimulus, thus driving European demand. Uh, similar situation in Asia. Asia doesn't need it as much because it has its own growth profile in the Southeast Asian economies. China is going to be a huge beneficiary of that. So then you come back to the United States and to the Americas, where again, there's no integration outside of North America. We did NATO, which by the way, was one of really the precursors of the tripolar world. NAFTA, sorry, not NATO. And now new NAFTA, but nothing with South America. That needs to change. There's every opportunity to say, okay, let's work with Central and South America to bring back the production from Asia, make it much closer, and integrate our hemisphere so that we can compete more fully with a 600 million person European region and a multiple billion Asian region. So we're, and this is thinking kind of very long term, not necessarily for portfolios today, but when you think about it in that way, B, you can see that A, the U.S. has less flexibility than Europe. B, U.S. is going to therefore need to use its fiscal approach. And C, the longer it takes us to recognize and execute, the further and further behind we are going to be. As I said, China is already moving. We're forcing China to move faster than it probably otherwise would have to become self-reliant and independent, particularly in the technology space. And then in Europe, you have the recovery fund and the Green Deal. The United States needs to develop a response that is more robust than what's currently in place. Well, we have a lot to think about, and you've certainly provided a lot of not just historical context, but present day, a lot of analysis of how we should be thinking about positioning portfolios. So Jay, I wanted to thank you for your time. It's been a great discussion. Your insights are appreciated. Thanks a lot. Dean, thank you. And it was a great opportunity. Hopefully we generated some alpha generating ideas for folks and great questions and appreciate the opportunity. 
You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time.